I welcome everybody to church today. Thank you for coming to church. I'm going to read the scripture passage. And, uh, and we'll get started. Our announcements are this Thursday we're doing Psalm 51 for the folks that come here Thursday night. And that's a good, that's by the best psalm of repentance that you read in the Bible. That's King David's psalm of repentance when he got called off for his big sin and adultery and killing a fellow and things and murder. But he, that's a good psalm, so do that Thursday night, 6 30. And we have been ended right about 8 o'clock, maybe 8 10. Yeah. All right? It's not home. No, no, I said I'm home by 8 30, so. But the thing is, is uh, that's this Thursday. And then we have, uh, and then, and then what, what else do we have coming up? We have a new woman's Bible study uh, starting at the 5th of October. It's called Seamless. It will just be about kind of a summary of the whole Bible to get to know the people and where they're at. Uh, it also, if teenagers are interested, it comes with uh, girls. Sorry, I have to say that. <laughs> um, it comes with a teenager um, girl book as well. So uh, the questions are probably a bit different in the homework. That will be uh, October 5th. We're going to start with that. The uh, theme for food will be soup and salads. <laughs> and um, we always eat together 6 p.m. and uh, have a little fellowship before we start the study. Then we have our pumpkin carving at the 31st so that our pumpkins are fresh <laughs> they will be christ-centered <laughs> we're not going to have crazy uh, faces on them and then in uh, december 5th i think it was it will be just the women fellowship like we always do for christmas all right so that's a lot of announcements there wow. and we're going to get some men's uh, shooting announcement come up soon we'll do that one more time before, we always want to do it goes. Church. <laughs> so not just men we'll do it everybody so we'll do everybody it was nice last time we did that but let's uh we're gonna i'm gonna read the word i'm only preaching like six verses today <laughs> all right but it's <laughs> so i'm gonna read this word mark chapter 4 verse 35 to 41. Okay, that's where we're at today. And, and it says in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, On that day, when evening had come, he told them, Let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along, since he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care what, what, that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified, and asked one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So that's the passage we're going to cover today. So there's a lot of good depth in it too. So you guys, it'll be good. I had a few extra verses too to compliment. Had to get a couple extra things. So. All right. But if you guys will stand up, we'll go ahead and we'll pray. And then we'll get started. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you so much today for each and every person that's here today, Lord. I thank you for waking them up, Lord. I thank you for giving them help. I thank you for giving them strength. I thank you for blessing them and watching over them, Lord Jesus. I thank you for making them and sustaining them, Lord. And I thank you for the faith that you put down inside of them and that you grow each time they're here. And Lord, I ask if there be anybody here without faith, Lord, that you give them that gift of faith, the gift of repentance, Lord, and bring them to you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I ask you that you help me to, to preach your word clearly Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, and help us to have good, godly fellowship with one another, building each other up and encouraging each other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 If you may stand it, if you can, if you can't, you can sit back. All right, let's go to our hymnals and go to 381. <laughs> Thank you. 
I didn't want to overload you with too many slides and stuff, but these passages in the Psalms are all about God controlling and saving folks from the floods, from the waters, from the sea storms there. All those passages do that. So we see more prophecy fulfilled with Jesus right here in this passage because he controls the weather, controls the storm. I'm not talking about like it may seem like it changed a bit. I'm talking about drastic immediate changes is what we're going to see. In this uh, story, we'll see the Creator controls creation. And we'll move on here. I got the first slide. It says, And on that day when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. So remember, there were tons of people crowding him. He had to be exhausted, so exhausted from all day long, people wanting healings, him teaching everybody. And yet, he had a mission to go do that we're going to see next week that's a pretty big mission on the other side of the sea and i did some research about it a bit and it's the sea of galilee is where they are and i've never seen it but bill has seen it i know and 
The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles by 7 miles. So that's that's pretty big. 13 miles by 7 miles. And so I'd say that's, I didn't. I meant to look up how big Lake Erie is, but I think Lake Erie is only 30 miles across or something, if I'm right. I may be wrong with that. But I mean, think about this. This is like, this is giant when you see a Sea of Galilee. And it's 700 feet below sea level. And the way that it comes down is the bottom is the Dead Sea. That's 1,400 feet below sea level, and I think that's the, the lowest thing on earth below sea level. Recently I've been hearing some secular advertisement that there's some body of water that's only like four inches deep that's lower than that, but that's only four inches deep. <laughs> okay, so to me, that's still the lowest body of water is the Dead Sea, but it's, it's in between and it flows down and there's mountains of stuff around it and it causes great waves, and in 1992, which wasn't that long ago, it's the year that I joined the Army. This young guy here is going to join the Marine Corps next year. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this guy. But in 1992, there was a storm that had 10-foot waves. So that wasn't that long ago on the Sea of Galilee. Imagine 10-foot waves. That would have been tremendous. It would be tremendous right now. Imagine if you're on Lake Erie and 10-foot waves are coming. You know, It would make you think you're about to lose your life probably, especially if you're on a small boat. And they even found... They excavated a boat once that was 27 feet long on the bottom of the Sea of Galilee that they dated all the way back to the first century, to the time of Jesus. And they found that archaeology. Now, who knows? That's probably not. It's not this boat, because these guys survived. But, but you know, they, people were fishing and things, and people still fish like crazy on the Sea of Galilee. There's still all kinds of fishing and stuff going on. It's a major source of people's income and things. And... Uh, so it's a pretty prominent leg, prominent feature. And think about this too, the disciples that had left Jesus, four of them for sure were fishermen, possibly seven of them were fishermen. So their trade, their, the way they made their living, their business, their skill craft was fishermen. So they knew how to handle boats and stuff. It wasn't like you and I, if we took a boat on Lake Erie and we don't know what we're doing and all of a sudden we're panicking because there's a storm. These are guys who were, I mean, they, I think of like leatherneck. You know, a fellow that's been out there in the sun so long, his skin all turns looking like leather, and it's crusted, and it's cracked, and these guys are seasoned sea fellows right there. They are out there, and they're going to be terrified with this storm that goes down. And uh, so they were seasoned, and then, like I said, seven of them. And plus, we can also see, especially if you look at the end of the book of John, after Jesus has died and uh, resurrected and comes back, and he tells them, cast that net over there, and 153 fish get pulled up. They never got rid of their boats, you know, so when they left everything to follow Jesus, they didn't sell what they had, put it in the storage or something, probably had some family members or something use it, but they still had those boats. So, so they had these boats. This, this fisherman concept was pretty big throughout the Gospels with uh, Jesus. And this is the picture that we find ourselves on. And the reason that most fishermen fished at nighttime was because the seas were calmer at nighttime. And I didn't know that. That's something I found out I thought was interesting. But at nighttime, the seas were calmer. It was during the day that things got a little bit rockier. At night, it was a little calmer. So that's why a lot of them would travel at night and even go fishing at nighttime out on the uh, Sea of Galilee. So it says, Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And that shocks me too. Imagine, we know what's about to happen. I read the story. You know, this giant storm's going to come. What about those other boats? What even happened to them? Did they like turn over? And one of them, the one that they found at the bottom of the sea there maybe? Uh, but there were other boatmen out there too. Imagine how those guys felt at this time. They didn't even know what was going on. But, uh, but they left that crowd and Jesus went with them in that boat. And there's other boats out there. I could see this like a calm evening. And I could see all kinds of boats just out there. Like if you're looking at Lake Erie at nighttime. I've, seen, I've never been on Lake Erie at nighttime, but I have seen in the daytime. You can look out and see some boats sometimes out there floating around. But these probably weren't the fancy boats like we have on Lake Erie. They're probably like, you know, a 27 foot long wooden boat, you know, probably not even undercarriage or anything to it. Just, you know, a, a, a basic boat. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And if you look, I've been looking more at Greek stuff, but I'm not talk, trying to talk Greek stuff, but this word fierce, there's several other words we're gonna see like, uh, that we're gonna see, but they all 
would translate well as mega as well. So we're talking like mega, like giant, giant waves. The three times we see this, this, the Greek word mega, you know, this one in this translation that translates it as fierce, but it's like a mega storm. And these seasoned fishermen are terrified, terrified. So, I mean, if you think about it, if they spent their whole life out there on the boat, whole life out there in the water, and a storm comes so bad that they are terrified for their very lives. You know, I read the CSV, it said they got mad. They're all like, hey, we're about to die. Aren't you worried about us, Lord, when they woke him up? So they thought it was a sure death type of situation was going on. And imagine the boat filling up with water. This is like some type of horror movie you watch where you're in there and the water's filling up in the boat and you're trying to get the water out and the and the waves are breaking over it and you I, I pick I've seen some of these movies there where it looks like the boat's about to crack in two or flip over as the waves are throwing it but that's what, probably what was going on right there and with the way the text says Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him teacher do you not care that we are perishing so we can see Jesus is asleep and this is the only time in the whole Gospels that we see Jesus sleeping there you won't find another place where you see Jesus asleep no you'll find a place where it says he had only had like a rock for a pillow but it doesn't show that he was sleeping this was the only time he's sleeping and imagine how exhausted it would have been and it also shows Jesus's humanity that he was fully God but he was also fully man and it's important that we understand that we have to be careful not to blend that. He wasn't like a mix of God-man. He was 100% man and 100% God. He needed sleep. He, he felt exhaustion. He, he felt hunger. You know, He had all these kind of things that we feel as well. And yet at the same time, he's also fully God. And he's laying there just exhausted. Exhausted and dead asleep. And imagine how this is going. It already said the waves are breaking over the boat you know, and everything. It says that... The, the boat's getting swamped with water. He'd probably be soaking wet, and I'd imagine kind of cold. I would wake up right away if someone threw some water on me. But Jesus is so exhausted, so dead asleep, that he's sleeping through all this stuff going on. I mean, it'd be like sleeping in the middle of a water park or something, with all the water just going over you, and probably extreme motion, too. And everybody else is wide awake and terrified, and they're looking like a... Like, it's like a, amazingly crazy. Like, why is he sleeping? But even they even thought, is he dead? Did something happen to him? How could he be laying there like that during this time? And we can also see in the way that they speak to him, they weren't just afraid, they were angry. They were upset. And you can think about yourself sometimes, you think about others. It's easier always to think about others, but we should be thinking about ourselves, is how angry we might get at God sometimes, like, God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why is this going on in my life? Why are all these things kind of going on? So they were both afraid and they were angry, and they're, and they're waking them up, and they're telling them this. They're like, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care that we're dying? So they wake him up out of his sleep. And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And this word perfectly is mega. Everybody said it's hard with the different texts with English translation. If you go in the Greek, you know, there's like five or ten words all the time that things could mean. But but the mega is a theme throughout three of these verses, three of these words in this passage right here. This was a mega calm, a perfect calmness, absolute stillness. Imagine how like eerie, how strange that would be if you went from the, the biggest storm you ever seen in your life and you thought for sure we're gonna die right here, right now, and all of a sudden it's calmer than it's ever been before. You know, I've sometimes I've seen Lake Erie and I have seen it where it's just totally flat and you don't see any waves at all and it's super calm. But most of the time you go out there, it looks like you know, a little tiny ocean to me. It's like a foot, two foot waves, you hear it, you see it, but once in a while it's perfectly calm. And it went from giant winds, great storm, you know, who knows, maybe it was like 10 foot waves, maybe even bigger than 10 foot waves, to nothing. As soon as he spoke, it came that fast, that powerful, absolute stillness. And we see, and what they saw is Jesus as the creator. Jesus is the one who could command nature itself. 
You know, people today claim they can change the weather or do this or that. You know, we've seen it all through the time, you know, doing rain dance or different things we hear about from other folks in the world. But that stuff doesn't do anything really, okay? It's just like, you know, high hopes, all right? This is something that immediately we see stuff go down. And they saw it. And, and all he says is, hush, be still. And the nature itself listens to him and changes immediately. The perfect calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Now that would have kind of stung, especially, especially as they were afraid and angry before. They were angry at him. Why was he sleeping? Why wasn't he doing anything about this? You know, why wasn't he like worried with the rest of them? Maybe they didn't even know if he could control the nature like this. But they were just like, hey, at least wake up and experience. We're about to die. Experience this with us. Say something to us. You know, you're our Lord, you're our, our Savior. And he says to them, why do you have no faith? That's what he says to them. And I could imagine this being a kind of like a rebuke in the way that it went, went at him. And, uh, and so, like I said before, there was the calm before the storm. There was the calm during the storm. And after the storm, there's no calm. Okay, now we see them very upset. They're shook up. And Jesus is going to shake them up even more now inside. And he says, why don't you, why are you afraid? Why don't you have any faith? And we can look at their side. We should always think about how's the other side, how other folks feel. Their lives were at stake and their inadequacy of their faith was exposed. And isn't this true with us too? We may think, oh, I'm like this giant in the faith and I'm all good. And then all of a sudden something really bad happens in our life and we really need another brother to encourage us <laughs> or sister or something to tell us, hey, it's going to be okay. It's all right. And you can see the inadequacy of your faith. You know, our, our faith is not that. The only thing our faith is solid because God gives us our faith because God keeps us remaining in our faith. If we think we can hang on to our faith on our own, we're thinking a little bit too highly of ourselves. It's God that gives us his faith. It's God that keeps us in this faith. And we can see that when their lives were at stake, you know, it showed how scared they were. You know, they lost the trust that they were here with the Lord, that everything was going to be okay. They were terrified, and they were getting on them. But if you read these verses in the Bible, and it lists all these verses. I do have some other ones listed later. But Hebrews 13, 5 to 6, 1 Peter 5, 7, and Romans 8, 38 to 39, talk about us putting our anxieties and cares upon God. Now, I know the last two by heart just about. But this one in Hebrews, I don't have it by heart, but it was really good. That's why I listed it. So I don't want it to go to waste. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you that verse, Hebrews 13, five to six, and it says, it says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. So we know God will never leave us, and He'll never abandon us. Therefore we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That, that's a big verse right there. It's a lot of power, especially if you're in a situation in life where you're afraid about something. Afraid about dying. Afraid about some disease. Afraid about some situation at your work. Afraid about something that's happened in your life. This is a very powerful verse. And, and uh, in my Bible, it's... it's bold. I will never leave you or abandon you. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And the reason that's bold is because that's exact scripture from the Old Testament right there. That's not just uh, scripture from right here in New Testament. You know, it's scripture with scripture backing itself up. And that's that's very strong. God's never going to leave us, abandon us. In 1 Peter 5, 7, I know Bill has it memorized because he told it to me this week, and I thought, man, that's awesome. It makes me keep memorizing it too when Bill has it memorized. is because I said one time when I preached Peter, I said, remember, Heinz 57 ketchup. If you've heard of Heinz 57 ketchup, you like to put in your hot dog, your burger or something, that's a great birth way to remember where is this passage, 1 Peter 5, 7, because it says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Because you know that he cares for you. He he cares about you. He wants you to take all of your troubles and put them on Him. That's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to fear on it on our own. He doesn't want us to handle it on our own. He wants us to lay it at His feet and trust in Him and put all these troubles on Him. In Romans 8, 38 to 39, 
I don't know it perfectly by heart, I could summarize it, but it's such a good one, I just got to read it. Because I, I tell you, since I started studying some more and I found that a lot of folks believe Romans 8 is the best chapter in the entire Bible, it really has brought my focus to that a whole lot more. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing can absolutely separate us from God. Not one thing. Nothing can separate us from God. Why would we be afraid? Why would we ever be afraid? We can trust. We don't have to fear. You know, fear something that we're human beings is something that's going to happen. But then that secondary thought, the secondary cause, what we do after that, we have some control about. You know, we have some control, and that is where we apply these verses that when we get afraid, when all these things go on, we go back to the Bible, we go back to the Word, and we say, this is what I believe, this is where I stand. You speak this to yourself, like we've seen in Psalm 42. It says, oh my soul, why are you so cast down within me? Put your hope in God, for He is your salvation. You know, we speak these verses to ourselves in those kind of times, and it'll help us, and it'll build us up. And I put all these verses here because maybe this is what these uh, apostles should have been doing, the disciples should have been doing. You know, they probably still knew the Bible pretty well, the Old Testament. You know, they which grew up Jews, always going to synagogue. But and a lot of this is Old Testament too, these, these bold or black and letters here that we know that God's not going to leave us, He's not going to abandon us, He's not going to forsake us. And this is what Jesus tells them, why do you have no faith? You may think this is the last verse, but I have a few more, okay? It says, they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So they get even more afraid when Jesus talks to them about this stuff. And Jesus calls them out and asks them, why are you afraid? Don't you have any faith where you're at? They get even more afraid. And you know why they got more afraid? Is why did their fear intensify so much more? Because think about it now. They just went from almost losing their lives in the storm, where you think, yeah, everybody would be scared of that, being in some boat and you're about to die, to now there's perfectly still waters. There's a perfect calm, and their fear is intensified it's even more afraid. It's very much afraid. And the reason they're so afraid is because of uh, ultimate xenophobia. That's something we hear in the politics all the time. That everybody's saying everybody's a xenophobic. You know, that they don't want to, they don't like women, or they don't like black folks, or they don't like somebody that's different. And that's what xenophobia means. It means somebody who's different than you. So anybody can be guilty of xenophobia. But they had ultimate xenophobia because they now see Jesus as outside of anybody like when you look at folks we can kind of typically categorize people you know we can say there's a black guy there's a white guy there's a Christian guy there's an atheist guy there's a uh, there's an educated guy there's a non-educated guy we can categorize people they couldn't categorize Jesus at all because nobody had ever seen somebody say hush be still and whoop the entire weather and everything changes that fast. He was outside of categories. And also, also, it's just uh, it's just extreme. And I, I have I have some I want to see some more stuff, but it's in the next slide here. So I don't want to get ahead of myself and pee myself. But this is just incredible. And if you look at the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very much the same. They call them the synoptic gospels. Okay, Mark's the shortest of them, but they're very much the same. John is, is a lot different, okay? It's only like 8% the same, but most of it is different there in the book of John. But in Matthew 14, 33, which is the parallel passage to the story of what we just read right here, let me show you what they do in Matthew 14, 33. In Matthew 14, 33, at the end of this, when they have great fear and terror, this is what they do, and this is a very appropriate response to what they do. This is, uh, this is beautiful. And it shows who Jesus is, too. It says, Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. And we know who gets worshipped. Only one person ever gets worshipped. God alone. You're never to worship anybody else besides God. So it's kind of like here they have this huge moment 
where they saw him as the creator that tamed the sea. And what did they do? They fall down and they worship him. They worship Jesus right there amongst them. A lot of people try to say Jesus wasn't God. I'm sure this kind of verse, they changed it in their Bible or done something with it right there. But there's a lot of versions. I don't know. I didn't look at all of them, but I looked at a few as I'm doing my studies that say they worshiped him in Matthew 14, 33. And that's what they did. So they're like just shocked and they have tons of fear. And now we're going to talk about that fear. And that, they, usually this is my last slide, but let me tell you, I have a couple more right after this one. <laughs> this is my norm right here. Okay? Not many, not many, just a couple. But, but my, my question to you, we're talking about fear now. You know, they had all this tremendous fear we built up to because of this incident. My question to it is, do you fear God? You should fear God. We should all fear God. So at the beginning of wisdom starts with fear of the Lord. It never says that you should stop fearing God. You should have a healthy fear of God. Because he is more tremendous than anything you could ever imagine. He's not something that we can control. All the false religions, mythology, everything else, they make gods that can work for them, that can do things for them. You know, they have, you know, uh, uh, gods that can help them be fertile and have kids, gods that can help them find stuff, gods that can do all these things. And those gods are basically like pawns working for them on a chess thing where they themselves are the main focus and that's the part but that's all false and it's all wrong we should look at God as the extreme we should look at God as the Almighty as ourselves as the small and he is the Lord he is the master we're the servant and I ask do you fear God and it I ask also does it cause you to humble yourself and trust him and worship him because that's the right response. That's the response that we see Matthew 14, 33 they had here. I mean, over here, you know, they're just like shocked and awe. And we're like, whoa. And they're totally afraid. The fear is even bigger than it was before. And Matthew 14, 33 showed that they, they worshipped him after all this went on. So that's the right response is we should humble ourselves, trust him, and worship him. And this, I like a guy named R.C. Sproul. In fact, I don't have many of these. Because I handed some out in Bible study, but I love to get R.C. Sproul's uh, devotional. He died a few years ago, but his church league and ministries and giant ministry with a lot of different pastors and stuff still going on, and these are excellent. So if you want one, come up and check, get get one from him. They're excellent though. But but R.C. Sproul was also a seminary professor. You know, there's Ligonier Seminary there, and he said that what he used to do is he would force his students to read a lot of atheist books. They'd have to read the hardest atheist books there were, people that questioned God, that hated God, and one of them was Freud. Freud hated God. He was not a Christian in any sense of form whatsoever was Freud. And Freud said that we invented religion to cope with fear. Because one question that comes up across the atheist realm that makes them upset is why is it that every people in every culture all over the world have religion? You know, it's not like you just find a culture of folks that don't believe in an invisible God, that they don't believe that there's a God out there. Every single culture as you look around, and it, it baffles the atheist folks. And the reason he would do this, R.C. Sproul was a genius. I don't know if I'd be on the level to do something like this, but it was excellent. But he would make them read the hardest stuff against Christianity, and then he wanted them to bring up what they read, bring up their questions, bring out what they thought, so he could help them, so they would build their faith, and they wouldn't just be lost out there thinking, oh, well, this guy was right or something. And he would even assign them to read it and write about it. But one of those guys was Freud, and he said, the reason all these societies and cultures have religion is because people have invented it to cope with fear, to make up for the fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of death. And that's what Freud said. And, but here's the point that R.C. Sproul would say to the people with Freud's objection with this is, and see, he said, however, no one would have invented a holy God more terrifying than the force they want to tame. You know, they would invent a God that would serve them. They would invent a God that would do what they wanted to do when they wanted to have it done. But nobody would invent a holy God. A holy God that is so far holy that we can never be that holy. We can never reach his level of holiness. In fact, we, will, we fall so far short of his level of holiness, it's, it's amazing. Even if we're born again believer, spirit filled, follow the Lord all our life and everything, we don't come near 
for the holiness of God, for what he is and who he is. And that's what those disciples saw. When they saw him tame the sea, when they saw everything stop, they realized they weren't just dealing with a guy with a lot of power. They were dealing with a holy God, a holy God. And nobody would invent a holy God. If you look at mythology and all these things, all these gods have some kind of sinful uh, weakness. Okay, They all had a sinful weakness. They all fight each other. They all have a little issue. There's something going on. With our God, we see absolutely zero weakness and 100% holiness. And we see no mercy whatsoever for any sin whatsoever. He doesn't say, it's okay to be this as a sinner. It's okay to be that as a sinner. When you read the Bible, if you just read the passages that talk harsh, that talk about the law and things, you should feel crushed. You should feel like, oh my, I definitely do not match up to this. I fall short. Some guy the other day was arguing, uh, some folks, they believe in the theonomy. Uh, they're guys who are post-millennium. Okay, I know, I'm pre-millennium. I believe there's going to be a rapture one day. I believe the Lord's going to return. I believe there's going to be a thousand-year reign. But there's pre-mill, and there's also post-mill, and then there's a-mill. You know, R.C. Sproul, I love him so much, he was an a-mill guy. But post-mill gets even stranger, okay? A-mill just believes it all comes out on the day of the Lord. But post-mill believes that one day we're going to come to a point in our lives as human beings that we will be following God perfectly like in the millennium right here on the earth you know that we'll somehow come to that and then when we come to that it'll also be like Ezekiel 40 to 48 where the law of God is back in action again we're like if you're a false prophet you're stoned to death you're executed you're killed there's all those kind of things that go by and and he he's really for that this fellow and he was asking other fellows why why aren't we why aren't we going so much more with our politics? Why aren't we killing all the false prophets and you know, all these false TV evangelists and different things that are making false prophecies? And and I I told him I said I said not false prophecy but other things I said I said if if that was the case I'd have been dead a long time ago. <laughs> and I think if we're honest, probably all of us would have been killed a long time ago. Think about it, if you read five books of Moses and you read that if you just picked up sticks on the Sabbath day death penalty happened to you. You know, if you were angry at your parents and you were a rebellious child, death penalty to your own child right there happened. It was tremendous. It was heavy. And e even in the sense of, of sacrifice and everything, there was so much stuff that even if you were trying to do the very best you could, you for sure would probably cross a line at one point into death penalty type of area. And that's the way it was back then. And I thought, thank God it's not like that in our day <laughs> for this fellow, okay? But, uh, but there are fellows out that believe that they're called theonomists and post-millennialists. But here, here we wouldn't make a holy God. We wouldn't make a God that's holy, that has all those kind of strict rules and things to live by. We would make a God that would please us to our comfort. If you look today at popular Christianity, I would say that's the type of God we would make. We would make a God that's all fluff, that's all about love, that's all about... Uh, no wrath, no anger, do whatever you want to do, there's no sin, it's whatever you feel is right in your own eyes. But you can look to the Bible in the book of Judges, that's the main theme. It says, and the people did whatever was right in their own eyes, and God crushed them, gave them disease, he brought wars against them, he did all these things. It wasn't the right thing with God. But if we were left to making up a God of our own, just like we see with fluff Christianity that's made up a God of their own, a God that always heals, a God that saves everybody, a God that uh, is only kind and there's no hell and there's no wrath and there's no sin and everything's just hunky-dory fine, that's what we would make. We wouldn't make a God like the God of the Bible. And that was Sproul's teaching against Freud with his idea that people just make religion to cope with fear. Because indeed, people have done that. There's a ton of false religions, but you know what? They all fall short in the end. None of them can bring salvation whatsoever. It's not a choose-your-own-adventure book with Christianity, all right? That's really how I see a lot of these false religions. It's all choose-your-own-adventure. We've got to look to the Bible. What's the Bible say? But we can also see that fear is the natural response for sinful human beings to exhibit whenever they are in the presence of God. So... If we go in the presence of God, we will have great fear. All right? Uh, I think I told you a few weeks back, I, I read something about uh, uh, a Burke Parsons. He's the actual pastor where R.C. Sproul used to be pastor before he died in, uh, in that church down in Florida. 
and he said, the Jehovah Witnesses were at his door, and he said, you know, what would you do if Jesus came up to you, you know, and he extended his hand, and he said, I know what you would do, you're a friend of Jesus, you think Jesus is a good guy in the Bible, different things, you'd shake his hand. He goes, I, I would fall down on my face, and I would worship him, and I wouldn't be able to speak, because I'd be in such awe, because I was in the presence of God. He goes, that's the difference between you and I, and he said it made the young Jehovah Witness guy, who was new, start to cry real bad, then the old guy was like, come on, let's get out of here, and they shoved away from there, okay? But he was speaking from the bottom of his heart, and I'm sure the young guy could see that. I mean, this was intense, that his love for Jesus, his worship of Jesus as God, and how real this was, that it wasn't just some, you know, perfectly fit, made up type of picture. And if you see in all these verses, I'm not going to look them all up, but I can tell you what most of them say, is Genesis 18:27 was with Abraham. When God showed up, Abraham had great fear when he saw God. In Job 42, 5 and 6, we preached that whole book for a year. That was a good adventure and good solid Bible adventure, not our choosing adventure. And Job 42, 5 to 6, it said that Job had great fear before the Lord when God showed up before him. In Judges 13, 22 is the story of Samson's parents, uh, Manoah. When God shows up and they realize it is God, they fall down and they have great fear. You know, before they thought it was an angel, when they found out it was actually God himself, they had great fear when they saw him. Isaiah 6, 5 is basically probably when Isaiah really became a believer, when God shows up and he brings them up into the throne room of God, and he says, he falls down in great fear, he says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. He has great fear, and this is what happens in the presence of God. And the same with Ezekiel in 128, Daniel in 10, 9, uh, uh, Luke 5, 8, Acts 9, chapter verse 4 and 9, and also Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, we see great fear when we're in the presence of the Lord. So it's a natural response for us. And believers today can rest confidently in the fact that through all of life's storms, the omnipotent Lord of creation is willing and able to deliver those who trust in Him. And I've preached this before, Romans 8, 28, that's what Jim should connect us to that, is that God works all things together for the good for those who love Him. He doesn't do it for those who don't love Him, but He does do it for those who love Him. He works all things together for the good. That word all is a big word, all, okay? It means everything. So, I've got a few more verses here that really show how much God loves us, all right? And I read this book, at least most of you see where my bookmark is right here. I'm finishing it right here. But this book, is tremendous, okay? If it didn't cost 13 bucks, I'd buy it for everybody here if I could get it for a couple bucks each. But they didn't. Mass quantity is still like 12 or 13 bucks. But this book was written by a guy named Dane Ortland, and he's a professor at a seminary of the Puritan style, you know, truly looking to the scriptures. Pretty much all the citations he makes are from a guy named Goodwin and a guy named Sibs from like the 1600s that were Puritans and loved God. And those guys happened to write entire books off of one verse. Four or five hundred pages on one verse of the Bible was how much they loved the scripture and would dig deep in it. And he said it's named gentle and lowly because in Jesus said, take my burden, take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and lowly. And there's not a lot of places we actually get to see who is Jesus in the scriptures, but that's one verse for sure. We see him describe himself as gentle and lowly. When I read this book, it made me want to sing that song the little guy sing, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Because I tell you, you feel so loved by God when you dig into the Word and you see just how much Jesus loves you. Tremendous amount, okay? And he goes, he hits every one of our weaknesses. He's like, we may all say this, we may all say it in church, we may say it out loud, but deep down inside the darkness of our heart, we probably say, but I know God's given me mercy, and I turned my back on his mercy. But I know that I, I wasn't supposed to sin, and I sinned anyways. Even when I felt bad, I was praying about it, I still went ahead and sinned. But I did this, but I did that, and we feel like, so I'm not so loved by God because I don't fit there. But he points this out in this book. It doesn't matter if you belong to Christ. He loves you. He loves you so much that he is available for you. He's there for you, and it's just tremendous love. And that's what these few verses are going to be about that I'm about to talk about right here. Because we talk about fear, we need to talk about how to get rid of that fear, how do you find a healthy fear with the Lord. And 2 Timothy 4.18 is right before 
right before Paul is executed by the Romans, he says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Some people try to say that Paul didn't know if he's going to make it to heaven or not. And they use that verse where he said that he fights the race and does this and that so that he himself may not be disqualified. You know, that's an attitude to have. That's not a, a, a thing to have that I can't have assurance of my salvation, that I can't know if I'm going to go to heaven or not, that I can't know if I'm safe or not. That's an attitude to have. And when people tell me these verses, trying to tell me their broken, messed up theology, I say, first we have to interpret Scripture with Scripture, and we have to look at the whole Bible. And there's a whole lot more verses to show our eternal security, our security forever with God. Once we're a believer, then we're always going to be safe in Him. And here's one of them right here, because he says, who's going to rescue him from every evil deed? God is. And that's a, and I think about that, I think, I bet that doesn't just mean every evil deed that other people do, it means every evil deed you have done. And the darkness that you have done, that you feel that you're going to be judged for, that you feel that you're going to uh, maybe not make it into heaven for or something there, God is able, and He not just able, it says He will rescue me. And Paul's not saying a maybe or an if. This is a definite. And he says He will bring me safely to the heavenly kingdom. We don't have to be afraid of dying. We don't have to be afraid of anything in life when we have the faith in the Lord because He has secured everything for us right there. And it's all to His glory. And like I said at the top, we are so loved by Jesus. John, Jesus said this in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Now look at this verse here. Who gives, you to, who gives you to Jesus? The Father gives you to Jesus. How many people that the Father gives to Jesus does, uh, does Jesus sort through? None of them. He takes every one of them. All. Every single person God ever calls will come to faith in Christ and will never, ever be cast out. Never. Everybody. 100%. If you're a genuine believer in Jesus... You will go through the entire thing. Everything is set for you already. Your life is set for all of eternity. We can't even put a year or number on that because eternity goes forever and ever and ever. That's what it says. He says, all, not some, not some of those that the Father give me. He says, all that the Father gives me, which shows how do we come to Christ? Only by God the Father giving us to Christ. Only by the Holy Spirit drawing us. None of us are going to just have a good idea one day and go to Jesus if if we think of God going to Jesus, that's because God's involved and God has drawn us to Jesus. And he says he will not cast us out. And I love, there's a little passage in this book, I didn't highlight it, but uh, he points out, you know, I, he said, but Lord, I, I, I turned my back on your mercy, I will not cast you out. But Lord, I've, I've sinned after I've been saved, I will not cast you out. But Lord, I, all the things I should have did, I didn't do, I will not cast you out. But Lord, I don't deserve any of your mercy. I will not cast you out. That's how you can look at this. And I tell you, this book, that's the kind of theme that goes through and through. And it's a solid scripture book, okay? It's not some wishy-washy guy book. He's a fellow that followed the Puritans. You think of Puritans, you don't think of wishy-washy fellows, okay? You think of pretty strict fellows with their black coats and their little white things that they have right here. But what a beauty this verse is right here, to remind yourself when you get afraid, when you, when you have these fearful times in life, when you feel rejected maybe by God, when you feel angry, when you feel upset, to remember that you're safe in Him and He's not going to cast you out. And the, my last slide is the rest of that passage. It's Jesus says, because he, he, he doesn't just say it one there, He continues to repeat it over and over. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing. So how many people that come to Jesus from the Father will be lost? Nobody. Not one person. 100% of people who are saved will be saved in the kingdom of heaven and be in heaven. You may say, well, I know some folks that say they got saved, walked a good walk, and now they walk a sinful walk. But it could be those folks never got saved. It could be those folks just were going along with the show, and they were never saved in the first place. That's a very difficult thing to judge. It's hard for us. It's only between them and God, really, whether they were ever saved or not. 
I know it's so much nicer when we see someone who's backslid or fallen away from the Lord to come back to God, because then we can know indeed that's genuine salvation. God had them in the first place. But if they never come back, what should we do? I say we treat them as a lost person. We treat them as somebody who needs the gospel. We treat them as somebody who needs to hear the gospel. We evangelize them. We love them. We share the truth with them. But we can know that everybody who is saved, who comes to faith in Christ and puts their belief in Him, He's everybody, it says this, it says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. So whose will is it? That you're saved? God's will? This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, everybody that God gives Him, which isn't everybody in life, okay? We know not everybody goes to heaven, okay? I'm not preaching some kind of false gospel like that, saying that there's no hell and we all go to heaven. Definitely not. The Bible talks about the other side too. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. But this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. Not have a shot at eternal life, not have a chance to possibly be in heaven, will have eternal life. Every single person that comes to God, that from the Father to Jesus, will have eternal life. And Jesus says, And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Talking about the great resurrection. So we can know for sure, 100%, absolutely, Jesus loves us. No doubt about it. Can you say Jesus loves you to a sinner fellow? Maybe a fellow who will never go to heaven? Yeah, you can say that too. But it's a different type of love. It's not the same love. God doesn't have the same love for everybody. I always say God will never send any of his children to hell. He doesn't day, do you send many people to hell that he created that are made in his likeness and his image, but he doesn't send any of his children to hell. Anybody he's ever chosen, anybody he's ever saved, they're his children, and he's, he's a good father that will work with them through and through all the way to the end and will never cast them out. He says, I will not cast you out. So you can know from the bottom of your heart, Jesus loves you. And if you can know Jesus loves you so much, you sure shouldn't be like, well, that means I can just go sin and do whatever I want to do. Because if that's what you think, you haven't got it yet. You haven't got saved yet. You don't understand anything yet. Lost people, workspace salvation people always throw it over to that. And I think, well, the reason you throw it over that is because you can't even understand it because you're dead in your sin and you can't even fathom understanding how much Jesus loves you, that Jesus saved you, that He died for you, He gave up His blood for you, that God gave you to Him to be to be His, and He saved you like that. And yet, people that say that, that well, then it means you can do whatever you want to do, they don't even understand it. They haven't even come anywhere close to it. Because the Bible talks all about what's the believer going to do. It says in Ephesians 2.10 that we're saved for good works. It says, in, I think in Matthew, it says, it says that, that those who are saved shall endure to the end. You know, they're going to persevere. They're going to keep on keeping on right there. You know, we see the picture of how his life lived out. You know, we see that verse in James that we're not saved by faith alone, but by works, it says. And that doesn't mean that the work saved you. It means that what does it look like when you're saved is there's works that are there. There's some kind of fruit that's there in your life. It's not just empty. It's not nothing. It's not just an imagination. It's real and it's tangible. I saw something that said the greatest evidence we can have of our salvation is the fruit we have in our life. It's truly the greatest evidence that we can have, at least amongst one another and things like that, is the fruit that we have in our life. That all means all. God will lose not, none, none of us says lose nothing, and we will have eternal life indeed. And here, this was a powerful, to me it's very powerful. To me, this book is very powerful too. I highly recommend reading it. For some reason we can't afford it, I'll buy you a copy if you really want to. <laughs> Church fund stuff there, okay? But this is an excellent book right here. It doesn't read that hard either. It's pretty good reading. But uh but it's something we got to hold on to, and we got to know how much Jesus loves us. And when these storms come in our lives, they're just tremendous storms like we have going on. Even today, the election stuff, the rioters, the looters, the protesters, the, the politics going on these days, the, the COVID-19 problems, everything going on in life, these are like storms that will probably get worse eventually. I'm hoping, we're praying this stuff kind of goes away. But eventually, these things are going to be worse than what we see in today, I'm sure, even in our lifetimes. And 
When as they do, we should trust in Christ. We shouldn't be afraid. We should hold on to Him and know that we're going to be okay. And I, I'm going to do this. I know my wife won't like me doing it, but I'm going to do it real quick. Because there's a great song, and it's called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Amen. And indeed, this is a solid song, I tell you. And my wife was worried we didn't have our hymn. I thought, oh, no, how can that be? But I looked, and it's in here. All right, so I'm going to sing just a few verses to you guys, all right? And think about these verses, because it's true. It's true. We sing it and say it, not because it's a lie, because it's true. All right? Well, you guys can try if you want, 164, okay? But we're going out in pillow here. No, it's all right. I don't want anybody to think you're a bad singer. <laughs> this is going to go out the pillow. It may go bad. They think I do it. Huh? All right, you can start this week. But so, uh, hymn 164. The friend we have is Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we offer. Jesus died for us while we were still his enemies, yeah. while we hated Jesus. He yeah. gave his life for us. So why wouldn't he want us to come to him despite however we've been, wherever we've been, come to him and feel safe. And you read the Psalms, the whole book of Psalms, is, a lot of them are just like that right there. They're all prayers coming to God in all kinds of troubles and things. So we can go to him, we can trust him, and he loves us. And he will not cast us out. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. He will not cast you out. You know, that's, that's a scary thing. A lot of people, they somehow think, but there's an exception for me. There's not an exception for you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he will not cast you out. You know what? The only work, the only work that, of works that happened was the work that Christ did on the cross. Because if you read the Bible, John 3.16 and John 3.18, whosoever believeth, shall have eternal life. Does that mean believe and be baptized? Believe and, and do a million things? Believe in all this? No, it just says believe. And then the contrary to it, 3.18 says, for whosoever does not believe is already condemned. They are condemned to hell already. And they don't have eternal life. And what's the stipulation for that? One stipulation, to believe. They don't have it because they don't believe. So what's it about? It's about believing. Faith, repentance, absolutely, they're necessary. But you know how we get that? As a gift from God. God gives it to us, and it's a gift from God. We don't stir it up ourselves right there to have regenerating faith. God saves us. He gives us the faith. He gives us the repentance. 
And that faith and repentance respond in belief toward him and a life lived for Jesus Christ. And with that, I'm going to close and I'm going to take some prayer requests. And my one of my favorite guys that always has prayer requests is in the back. I know John will have a prayer request. If not,